Hello, this is my video on 10 things you didn't know about ODK. Um, or at least 10 things that I've picked up with my time in the software that I felt were worth trying to share with the community. Um, so some of these are quite specific features, others are more general. Um, I originally wanted to call this top 10 tips for using ODK, but um, there's, I won't be going through a detailed kind of how-to for every thing that comes up, but I will obviously try and give you a good uh, an overview and point to other guidance. So things like the ODK documentation and the forums are, are more sort of definitive sources of information. Obviously wanted to try making a different type of video as well, just to make it a bit more a bit more interesting for me and maybe a bit more interesting for you to watch. So um, as well as going to screen captures and things like that, I can do things like this. Oh, hi, I didn't see you come in there. And you can see that the uh, the sun in my kitchen is already starting to come around and uh, make this very bright. So um, I need to rush on with making this video. Um, thanks for all your, your likes and comments and uh, subscriptions from, from my previous ODK videos. I'm, I'm you know really happy with how those have gone. Um, if you'd like to give me an excuse to buy a better camera, I'm just using two kind of cheap web cameras at the moment. So... Um, I don't need much of a I don't need much of a push to go <laughs> to think about to buy, buying technology and things. It's always exciting. Um, so hopefully the quality is okay. Um, if you're anything like me, you probably just put the audio on and uh, listen to it in the background. Who knows? You know, in in 2019, I might actually make more than two videos. So watch this space. Um, for those of you on the channel who are particularly interested in ODK, just a heads up that I will be loading up some other types of videos, uh, kind of teaching related and lecture related content that I've got to do. Um, but I will probably get around to do more ODK videos in the future, but this isn't going to 100% be an ODK uh, channel. So back to the point of making this video anyway. Um, sort of 10, 10 little interesting things that I've found out about ODK over the years. So as the ODK, as the tagline states on the on the lovely new website, it aims to be the, the standard for mobile data collection. Once you've had a bit of a browse around the types of deployments and applications that ODK has been used in, you can begin to see how broad that ambition really is and how many different features it's going to have to support, how many different ways of working are going to potentially be included. So you should definitely follow at OpenDataKit on Twitter or go to the forum in the showcase section to see the the real range of projects that open data kit's been used in and it'll probably give you some some ideas what that also means when you're getting into it and you're just focusing on that specific project to begin with you probably are going to miss you know there's no way you could learn all of open data kit um, in just getting that one project up and running and it's quite interesting putting this sort of video together because it makes you think about the types of limitations that you can accept on your projects versus maybe the types of limitations that other people can accept on their projects. Some of it, a feature that you really have no use for might be absolutely critical for someone else. So, you know, major kudos to the Open Data Kit community and team for, for really keeping those, those gates as wide open uh, as they possibly can and really kind of making it this sort of foundational approach. So as I say, some, some of these things aren't necessarily features, they're just little things that maybe tripped me up. Certainly the first two are. Um, and what I'm planning to do, I'm planning to post this video on the ODK forum, and then we'll see what kind of other tips and hints the, the community maybe has, and um, we can do another video like this. Because um, I think it's just useful introductory stuff for, for people getting into it. You know, to think about, is this suitable for my project? Is this the kind of thing that I can learn more about? Or how do I how do I communicate it to other people in the sort of team or the organisation that I work in that this is the kind of tool that um, we should be using for whatever, whatever purpose? So number one is that input data is limited to 255 characters by default. Now, I ran into this issue with um, regards to text data. And there's a good reason behind all of this, and actually ODK and Aggregate does warn you when you upload your kind of files that, you know, don't forget, 
everything by default is limited to 255 characters. So if you're putting in a text question into your form or your survey and you just think, oh, people can just write whatever they want in here and that will be saved, it will only save the first 255 characters of that input. It won't break anything else about the form. It won't throw errors, you know, anything um, catastrophic, but it, you will just lose the, any information that's put in after that 255 characters. So characters, in case you didn't know, are, are really everything from numbers to letters, symbols and white space characters. So spaces, enter, tab, that kind of thing you might not think of. And all fields in ODK are limited to 255 by default, not just text, but for things like numbers, it's probably not going to, you're not going to encounter that as much of a problem. So email address, maybe other contact details, a, sh a short comment, but longer comments, you're going to, you're going to find that might be a bit of an issue. It's quite easy now to extend that um, 255 limit. I usually use one, 1000 to 2000 for comment boxes. The, the theoretical maximum is 16,000 characters, um, but I think there's probably some efficiency concerns um, with that, and I can't really think why you'd want to do want somebody to type in 16,000 characters. Um, another point of reference for you was an article I saw um, studied emails going around in an organisation, and the average email length there was 1,300 characters. So if you're expecting people to write and emails worth of, of information, then then maybe just ask them to send you an email instead. <laughs> if you do, so you can adjust that 255 characters fairly straightforwardly. Um, you kind of add a, add a column and then add a little section that specifies the number. Um, if you want to actually limit what people put into any kind of input boxes, then you might want to start getting into the world of regular expressions. Um, but fair warning, as the, as the old saying goes, when you have a problem and you think, oh, I can solve that with regular expressions, well, now you've got two problems. Anyway, it's a different topic, I suppose. Number two, then, is that... Uh, ODK Aggregate only shows you 100 forms um, by default. And again, this is something that the software tells you. It's just something that I overlooked in the first instance. So when you've got your, maybe you've got your first kind of form up and running, it's your first kind of real world use of the software. You're probably going to load up Aggregate. You're going to be watching those responses come in quite keenly just to make sure that everything's going okay. And once you get up to 100 in that initial view, you'll find that you can't scroll any any further. Um, and it's quite easy to just change that with a little box on the side and type in how many responses you want to look at. Or, of course, you can just download. You can just export that data and look at it that way. I looked on a, you know, your last response says, oh, this was done on Tuesday. And you're looking at it on Friday thinking, oh, um, I know there should have been responses coming in since then. Why is the last one seem seeming to be from Tuesday? So, so just a really a really silly mistake that that I made, um, and a very easy one to to avoid. You might think, you know, well, why why doesn't it show everything by default? I mean, as a non techie kind of person, I can only just you know assume it's to do with saving server space and the server costs and things, and keeping everything very kind of low low cost. Um, and it's and it's very easy to just change that manually yourself if you want. If you imagine it had to, if it had to load up, if you had tens of thousands of responses and it had to load those up every time you just logged in to check something completely completely different. That's just a bit of a waste, isn't it? So the new um, the kind of upgraded version of ODK Aggregate, if I put it that way, called ODK Central, which is in development at the moment. Um, I've noticed that does have this basic feature where it will just show you the number of submissions without you having to load up the whole data so that's obviously that's one to watch that's a that's a handy feature amongst other things that ODK Central will do so all I can say is just remember that that box is there <laughs> let's move on to uh, number three number three is about um, there are different ways of randomizing answers um, can you randomize the order in which answers are uh, shown in ODK? And the answer is kind of yes, with single and multiple choice questions. Again, I'll show you 
on the video, there's a column to add, and you add the, the randomize equals true bit next to that question, and it will shuffle those, shuffle those up every time uh, the form is loaded up. So that's kind of one way of doing randomization, but there's quite a lot of interesting discussions on the forum over the over the over the years about all the different permutations and variations that could have. So one option that was sort of suggested before this randomize quick kind of randomize label thing became possible. You do is set up X number of groups. Let's say three. You set up three different groups of questions randomize that number and depending on that number the user will be sent to one of those three groups of questions so you'd have to make you'd have to put in three separate groups and then order them in whatever sort of variation that you wanted to to do um, but that's still that's still a potentially interesting and useful feature to think about anyway because it might be that maybe only one in three people gets asked that question that, will, that might be something you could do. Um, and with different, as I say, with single and multiple choice, the little randomized tag works quite well. In other cases, maybe with text data or sort of matrix type questions, all those kind of things, um, the, that might still be the best way to randomize how those appear. Um, you know, the main, use, the main use for that is to prevent things like order bias, so if you're worried that people will, if there's particularly if there's a very long list of options, that people will just select the first one or possibly the last one as well, can something you read about. Um, so just shuffling them up will 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 help there. So number four, and we've got a a little guest come and join us here. Um, you want to have useful names for your variables, but you can't have white space characters. White space characters are ones to look out for. So white space characters are things like space, tab, enter, um, and they can cause essentially that they can cause the software to get a bit confused, particularly when it comes to multiple choice questions, because the spaces are how it kind of interprets, you know, where one option begins and when another option starts. But in general, it's worth having to think about, you know, useful ways of naming your um, all your different variables. Because one of the big uses for Open Data Kit, for me at least, is that over time you can kind of build up quite a big um, catalog of questions and variables that you've used before. So it's really it's really useful to be able to to kind of build on those or kind of have different subsets of those that you can you know readily tell what's what but i suppose the thing with white space came up the the thing with white space characters came up with me particularly because i was thinking about what if you want to share that kind of raw data with someone who doesn't necessarily have the kind of key to interpret what all those variables are so wouldn't it be easier if just in that spreadsheet of responses it said your answer option was yes in the last 12 months and it just says that in the spreadsheet rather than option four or you know whatever it was that you uh, whatever it was that you chose as the label. So that was why I wondered about it. You can still have you know like yes underscore in underscore the underscore. You can still make that data human readable, as it were, um, but avoid using white space characters is is a good general rule. Number five. Can I use Open Data Kit on my Apple device or iOS device? Um, the short answer is yes, via as long as you're prepared to use Enketo to do so, um, with some caveats. And the longer version is no, and it's probably not likely to happen anytime soon. And I suppose here we do specifically mean ODK Collect, the the mobile app part. Um, the, the, quite a few people have asked this question over the years. Um, some people have even suggested that they are working on that, on a ODK Collect for iOS version, but nothing has come of that yet. Essentially, the cost to rewrite all of ODK Collect, and I, I imagine probably some other bits as well, to rewrite that and to keep it up to date and to add all the new features and things as they come around, is just too high when you compare it to the value of um, 
being able to use that on an Apple device when you can just kind of use Inketo anyway and get around. That seems to satisfy 99% of cases. I think the majority of people asking for this feature just want to be able to try out ODK Collect on their own personal Apple device. When it comes to actually deploying that, even if it's just at like two, you're going to get two or three devices or maybe ten devices to give out to be going and doing field work with for your enumerators and your you know researchers to use. In those cases, you're probably going to buy Android devices anyway for that sort of use. Um, I'm always interested to look here in the UK anyway, at least to look at where businesses are using tablets and things in those kind of environments. If you get Royal Mail come to your house and deliver a package, they give you the little thing to sign and it's on a, you can tell it's an Android device. They're surprisingly expensive, those things. Um, or in some shops like Argos, you can place your orders on an Android tablet. Or in McDonald's, they've got uh, tablets to keep you know kids entertained and stuff. When stuff gets deployed at a large scale, it seems like Android is, is the way to go. Um, so that's, uh, again, that's another. So it's an interesting uh, problem because you think, well, if it persuades more people to use Open Data Kit, then maybe it is worth having this Apple app, this Apple support, um, getting people to use it on their personal devices to just kind of try it out or when you're trying to convince other people in your organization that they might want to use this software you know that does have some value but at the moment you know no one's going to put in the time a considerable amount of time and cost i mean you can see maybe some suggested costs in in the forum posts and things like it wouldn't be it's not we're kind of used to that with our own personal devices you use Twitter or you use a web browser or whatever, you just assume it has an Apple version and an Android version. But we don't think about how much it costs to actually maintain that and support that. Um, so ODK for iOS, I mean, it might show up one day, ODK Collect for iOS, but um, don't let that stop you in the meantime. Number six is that you can use ODK Briefcase as a way of kind of archiving or downloading files from an ODK aggregate server. Um, so I'd primarily looked at ODK Briefcase as an option for um, just for transferring files offline, for say from one tablet or mobile device onto a computer without having to go through ODK aggregate. But you can actually pull down all that information from an aggregate server or push it back up to a different aggregate server. So I came across this when I had an aggregate server up for maybe a year or so. I hadn't really used it in the last couple of months and you know was looking to take that down and just wanted to make sure that I had kind of backed up everything off there. Um, because I wasn't 100% sure if I'd saved everything locally off that. It can be quite easy to lose track of. So through ODK Briefcase, you can do that. Um, I can't quite remember how long it took to download everything, but obviously there's quite a considerable number of files it's got to go through there. I suppose once you kind of know that you can back stuff up in a relatively easy way, it's further encouragement to make sure that things like you're you're using the latest version of aggregate you've not just installed it and left it up there for ages um, out of convenience it's quite convenient to to just take things down and load up a new version and, and so on and so on uh, number seven is that it's quite easy to create these handy bookmarks or, or widgets on your home screen of your mobile device your Android device for using ODK Collect or Inketo. Um, so even though I had an Android phone, I wasn't 100%, I didn't really use widgets a huge amount, so I didn't look really to see if this was an option with ODK Collect um, straight away, but it's it's very useful. So when you're handing off these devices to people who are going to you know go out and use them, and you're not expecting them to know much about the software, you can just give them one button on the home screen for them to press rather than open up ODK Collect, select the right form, and then start kind of filling it in. Um, the same thing, as I say, is, is possible with Inketo. It's just that you kind of create a bookmark for that web page, and then that can go on the home screen as well. 
So there's a number of other things you can do to make sure your devices are nice and straightforward to use. So I've used um, Nova Launcher is quite a good option it seems for customizing the layout um, of uh, particularly how many home screens you have available. So on my kind of personal phone, I probably have four or five screens of apps to flick through on you know when you turn on the phone. But if you just want it to do that one purpose, you can restrict that to just one home screen with one icon on it, and then you know people aren't going to get lost in in navigating how to use the software. Uh, number eight is encryption. So ODK does support 256-bit encryption, um, and without going into data protection, GDPR, and all the rest of it, 256-bit um, encryption is essentially unbreakable um, unless you have a quantum computer or are some kind of supervillain. It does take, there's, there's a, there are further steps to turn on that encryption. Essentially, it would, even if you physically lost that device or that SD card, or somebody even intercepted the data, you know, whilst you were sending it to, uh, to aggregate or, or wherever, you wouldn't be able to decrypt that um, without the kind of, the, the key that you have. Um, to in, in setting that up. Put, turning on encryption does then limit some of the uses that you can use ag aggregate for. I think the preferred method for, for using encryption is that it will just be sent to aggregate, but you'll still need to use something like ODK briefcase to actually download that information and decrypt it locally um, to make it actually usable. So you do cut off the, the function of aggregate being able to send that data somewhere else um, but presumably if you're looking at that kind of sensitive data then that's a step that you're kind of willing to take anyway. Um, encryption of that sort doesn't exist for Inketo yet but it is a feature that's kind of requested so I wouldn't be surprised if it turns up eventually and uh, the terrifying Black Panther has just wandered into the studio. Moving on so these last two points are about using Enketo um, specifically. So the first one was just how do how you deactivate surveys on Enketo via the API. So if you've if you've installed Enketo yourself, you're probably capable enough of figuring this sort of thing out. But for people like me, um, or maybe other people who've who've on the kind of paid options for Enketo, where you don't have to install it yourself, you just buy a certain allowance of forms that you can have live at any one time. So it's relatively easy to launch Enketo forms from ODK Aggregate um, once you've exchanged the API keys between the two and set that up. A little button appears in Aggregate with Enketo and you click that and your form is kind of launched and that obviously uses up one of your allotted slots. But then deactivating it is where you have to use the API. So the way I've been doing this is to use something called Git Bash um, you can kind of follow the API, copy and paste in all the relevant values to that, and it gives you the relevant command that you can paste into Git Bash in my case, and it will deactivate that survey and give you, you know, one of your um, slots for an Inketo form back. Um, so the other thing is, I suppose, the API is much more involved than that. The button in ODK Aggregate only kind of launches that one type of form and as we'll get on to in the next point that's you know that's not all Enketo can do um, but just to say from a non-techie point of view you might think you know why aren't they why aren't they more integrated I suppose but when you think about it ODK and Enketo are they're related but separate um, there may there are obviously lots of people who use ODK who don't use Enketo whatsoever so for something like aggregate to then have all of these extra features that deal with Inketo. Maybe you even have to take into account the billing side and how many slots you know you paid for and you've got available and all of a sudden it becomes there's a lot of extra work going on there that neither sort of software um, specifically wants to support. There are paid versions, you know, there, there are paid options for software that runs on top of ODK and Enketo that will deal with that kind of micromanagement for you but if you're just using them kind of raw um, 
you do have to do that kind of thing yourself a little bit. And uh, as, as we'll get on to in the second point, just pressing that one button in ODK Aggregate is not everything that Enketo can do. Number 10 is about single use surveys in Enketo. So by default, Enketo will kind of take the same approach as ODK Collect. Once your person finishes that form, it will, well, it'll, on Enketo, it'll hang around for a few seconds, it'll let you know when the form's been submitted, and then it'll stay on that page in the assumption that you're going to go back and fill in another form straight away. But obviously, when if you're sending that out on the web, which you can do, and is obviously a very useful feature of Inketo, um, people are more used to finishing a form, finishing a survey, and then immediately kind of leaving and going somewhere else. You're not going to want each individual person to potentially fill in loads of responses or to not know that their response has been recorded. In Again, using the API for Inketo, you can get a specific get a specific link that will also redirect someone to a website kind of of your choice after they've finished that survey and it quite clearly confirms that their response has been recorded there's two slight variations in how that works you can have a survey that people can go back to multiple times potentially on the same computer if if you need to or you can have another another way of setting that up where if you come back to that link, it will say, you've already completed this form, uh, go away, <laughs> in nicer words than that. But you can see that potentially both would be useful. Another cool thing about this is that you don't, it doesn't use up two of your Inketo slots. You don't have to set up two different surveys. Um, you can kind of have the repeatable ODK collect like Inketo survey running, and you can also have the single use link out there kind of on the internet at the same time as well so it's useful to sort of um, be able to do both of those approaches but not have to set up multiple forms so in conclusion before the sun makes it impossible for me to record anything more in my kitchen um, there's always something new coming up with ODK so you know obviously keep an eye on the forums keep an eye on the Twitter at open data kit um, and I'll be interested to hear from you. What are your kind of top things you didn't immediately know about Open Data Kit when getting started, or little ways you've used it that might be surprising? Um, I'll post this on the ODK forums, and if there are enough suggestions, you know, there and maybe in the comments here, um, I'll, I'll make another video. Um, but I hope that maybe the broader the broader message of the video is that. Um, Obviously, if you've got suggestions for features, if you've got things that you'd like to see in the software, um, you know, do go and get involved in the in the forum and the community. Um, for one thing, you might already find that there is a solution out there that other people have already thought about and encountered those problems, or maybe come up with a, a kind of roundabout way of, of of achieving the same aims. Or you know, you might find you might be able to find other people who can help who you know help work with you to make that happen because um, over the over the few years that I've been using it you've seen features like I know for one the randomization issue um, I saw that you know being talked about and now it's now it's implemented now it's there things like the single use surveys on Enketo it was kind of talked about and now it's there um, doing signatures in Enketo for quite a while um, was it was a requested feature and and now it's there so you know if you get involved and you make good suggestions and you obviously try and contribute yourself where you can um then these things do happen so um there's all sorts of other things that you haven't that i haven't even really fully explored yet like um odk central is quite new um and odk2 the whole kind of odk2 set of tools even though it's not going to be called odk2 um for much longer um, so hope that's all been useful and I look forward to doing another one of these videos and seeing you next time. Bye bye. What the user's going to see and then also I might have to go in the outtakes I suppose.